Uh, hello, everybody, dear subscribers of my YouTube channel. Uh, so I would like to invite, I would like to introduce my guests, Mr. Renker Klochik, uh, who is the chairman uh, of uh, Pan European Union Austrian Division, uh, Mr. Pichler, who is a programmatic director for the Center of Media Literacy in Vienna, and Mr. Günther Hecklinger, who is the chairman uh, of Europeans for Tax Reform. I thank you very much, dear gentlemen, for joining this interview today. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, so You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. So I would like us for the next uh, half an hour to talk about the station, which uh, uh, now take place uh, near the Polish border and uh, all uh, uh, political repercussions which this situation uh, uh, will uh, actually provoke. Uh, so, um, Mr. Kluczyk, uh, you see that uh, you represent the Pan-European Union, so organization uh, which uh, um, is deemed to promote the European integration. And, and uh, uh, you see now uh, how uh, European states uh, uh, react to the crisis uh, on a Polish border. You see that there is no any unified reaction, so there is a diversified reaction. Germany has one reaction, Austria another, and Polish uh, has a third reaction. So, uh, do you think that uh, this crisis, which now uh, uh, po uh, Poland faces, uh, uh, can actually provoke the serious uh, repercussions to the future of European uh, coherence? Uh, well, that's exactly the problem. Uh, if Europe does not unite and is not united in the reaction to this uh, crisis, to this provocation, to this, I would call it a hybrid war when uh, when uh, uh, Lukashenko is using migrants to destabilize uh, the European Union. If Europe does not uh, answer with one voice, with one opinion, with one reaction, then yes, this is a very, very big danger for the unity of Europe. And uh, if we lose that, uh, then we are lost. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fechlinger. Uh, you uh, promote European integration in different ways also. Um, you insisted upon uh, Germany and Poland and even Ukraine to open up the gates and let uh, uh, migrants to actually uh, to come to European Union. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Fechlinger, uh, uh, do you foresee if, uh, uh, actually any um, uh, any bad features, any any repercussions? for European Union, if European Union actually will allow the third states to threaten itself uh, by trying to, uh, you know, uh, promote the in <clears throat> migrants. Thanks a lot. First of all, <clears throat> I don't like the term migrants because it's human beings like you and me, like all of us. And they are in a desperate situation out there in the cold forest in the winter of Belarus. And they are abused ultimately by a terrible dictator who is not a legitimate uh, president of Belarus. He has lost his legitimacy last year in his fake elections, and he is a dictator anyhow since 26 years already. So he shouldn't be in power. But these poor people are ultimately like hostages in this struggle. And we are the European Union of Values. We are a moral union. We are, the, we are built on the fundament of human rights. So it's for us very important to help these people and ensure they have adequate shelter, they have also food, they have uh, the protection from uh, the situation that they could freeze, and some of them have uh, died already. I think nine people died already. So I think the European Union is very well advised to show compassion and uh, respect for human rights. And I think especially the German state and the Austrian state should take these refugees in and also avoid this escalation because it's like a trap of Putin. He wants basically to have a pretext for the annexation of Belarus. And that's the background of it. And he wants uh, to play ping pong with the Polish nationalists, which both of them, the Russian extremists under Putin and the Polish nationalists, they uh, somehow play this up in an escalation and that hurts Europe and we should be compassionate and help these people. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pickler. I think there is a misunderstanding because um, uh, there are uh, you know, different terms 
One term is a migrant, another term is a refugee. So not all migrants actually are recognized as refugees because uh, to become a refugee, you have to apply for the special status of refugee. And what I noticed in European media that uh, uh, very frequently, actually, uh, this situation is presented as a, uh, an attempt by refugees to escape from uh, different circumstances and to come to uh, European Union to save their lives. Uh, but when you go uh, and scrutinize seriously the situation uh, through different media outlets, you see that actually these people, they paid uh, several thousand dollars uh, to get to the Minsk and then to uh, enter uh, European Union through our Polish borders. So actually their choice was a matter of their decision because um, they did not escape from war. They, uh, it was their decision as a migrants to come to, let's say, European Union. Uh, so uh, do you see here a kind of uh, manipulation and kind of media literacy abusement when we try to uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, when, when Belarus, especially not we, but Belarus try to present this case as, as the case uh, of uh, refugees trying to enter European Union? Uh, we don't hear you. Um, I think there is a huge difference if we compare it to the situation with Turkey. I mean, it's not I'm the le least person who wants um, to defend um, President Erdogan, but um, the situation with Turkey is uh, different in the way that um, Turkey actually borders on a lot of countries in the Middle East and the refugees enter Turkey directly. And also Turkey is um, a country where a lot of refugees actually live. So they are basically the Syrians are a minority there and they um, take part into the society and um, there, there are integration issues and it's a Turkish issue. I don't want to go very deep into that. I'm not an expert in the integration in Turkey, but it's a completely different um, situation if we compare it to uh, what uh, Mr. Lukashenko does, because he is actually importing them, um, and I mean, um, biplanes and uh, charter planes, and he, what he also did is he um, invented new airports, so airports for domestic flights are now international airports, just to... Um, to, to create this escalation with Poland. Um, I'm not an expert to comment on um, the people um, um, about their motives and why are they fleeing or why are they migrants or refugees. I know that their terms are different and that, um, but they are, and I agree with Gunther, they are human beings and the humanitarian situation on the border is terrible, um, no matter what the, um, motives for the people are that they are there and i also have to say that the situation for poland is very difficult because we don't know um what mr lukashenko is actually trying to prove yeah because if um, poland accepts all the refugees then he um, will send more and we know that in europe this will um create a lot Lot of discussion um, because Poland will not take them. They, they will um, go to different countries like Sweden or Germany, for instance. And we will have a maybe similar situation like in 2015. The European Union will have a lot of discussion, a lot of problems, maybe even um, some far right movements. And this is um, what we also want to avoid. So um, this, is, this is another problem. If you ask me about disinformation, uh, um, uh, I think that um, Lukashenko is, is not as clever as Putin. So there is no storyline uh, to make him look good. So I checked what people are saying about uh, his motives. And uh, even if, if we talk about left-wingers or, or liberals that they want to help the refugees, which um, by the way, help is of course needed if they are freezing and if they don't have food. And then they also blame Mr. Lukashenko for the situation. And uh, he is a comic book dictator already. And nobody believes him that this is all um, an accident, that this is all um, just a coincidence. So um, everybody knows that this is a process that he created and the whole escalation is uh, created by Lukashenko. And many people told me, don't say it's Belarus, it's Lukashenko because... Um, 
the people from Belarus, they don't, um, made, at least many of them, they don't recognize him as the president anymore. Uh, Mr. Kulchik, we can put this situation in different way. Um, European Union is based, and democracy actually in European Union is based on the equal rights. Yeah, so uh, the law in European Union has to be equally applicable to everybody. Uh, no matter what, uh, they are EU residents or they are non-residents of EU, but the law has to be equally applicable. For instance, when, uh, uh, you know, when the person from third state uh, wants to come to European Union, uh, he or she has to obtain visa in legal way to, to, to enter European Union. And here you see many people who actually come to uh, come to the border, they don't want to submit their documents, they don't want to uh, actually stick to the special uh, legal procedure of European Union, they want a European Union to open the gates and let them in. Uh, do you think actually that uh, if European Union uh, allows such behavior, it will mean that uh, the, uh, the principle of uh, rule of law which is, uh, uh, which is uh, on the top of European Union democracy will be suspended. In case the European Union accepts that these people are crossing the border illegally um, in these high numbers, and why are that way uh, coming from Belarus, paying 5,000 or more others to being brought to Minsk or other airports somewhere in Belarus. And I think many of them are intelligent to know intelligent enough to know that they are manipulated and misused by Mr. Lukashenko. If the European Union would accept that, uh, then more and more people would come and this would be the end of the rule of law in this situation. Uh, there has been a decision by the uh, European Court for Human Rights on a similar situation in Spain with these two enclaves, uh, Ceuta and Melilla, where people crossed this uh, this big fence and the Spanish police brought them back by boats to the, I think, to Morocco. And this went to the court and the court decided uh, there have, there are legal ways to come into the European Union. So because they do not use the legal way, it is legal from the side of the Spanish police to bring them back without giving them the chance to ask for asylum. So. To say it in a simple uh, picture, if you have a house and the house has doors and windows, and if you come through the window, it is correct to kick you out of the house. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Fecklinger, um, European Union is not a state, it's a supranational organization. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, despite the fact that the, the, the member states, uh, they preserve their sovereignty and their international policy, still, um, uh, still they have to coordinate their international policies, member states of European Union. And when Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, comes out and call Lukashenko, uh, and uh, uh, after this call, we, we hear um, uh, we hear uh, voices from Poland, Lithuania, who are not satisfied with this call and what, uh, with what Merkel has done. Uh, what do you think? Uh, legitimately, uh, Merkel could call uh, Lukashenko, but from the point of the whole European Union interests, uh, actually, she uh, has uh, done a very bad job because um, uh, she actually allowed the dictator to feel that he can manipulate different interests within the European Union. Do you see here a problem that Merkel uh, did not consult her partners from uh, uh, member states, uh, especially members who have the common border with Russia or Belarus, uh, before she called Lukashenko? Look, this is, of course, a big issue, but my opinion on that one is quite clear. Ultimately, Germany is the adult in the room. And as the Polish, especially the Polish, have behaved extremely irresponsible in this border management crisis, because it's very much also the Polish who, and especially the nationalist, the Peace Party, who is very much profiting from riling up the Polish electorate in a kind of nationalistic stance. 
because it was in no way necessary to escalate this row at the border in that kind of militaristic way. And now Germany, which is ultimately the key power in Europe, has to defuse the situation because nobody is interested in a big military conflict either with Russia or with Belarus. And now what she has done is ultimately all these things have to be solved financially. And she has now called Lukashenko because she has to financially defuse the situation because the Polish have messed it up completely. Of course, you know, the responsibility for it, the whole thing is with Putin and we are in this second Cold War and Lukashenko is a dictator, we all know that. But the uh, real uh, responsible, why the situation has uh, gone out of control or is close to going out of control is the Polish nationalists who are very much benefiting from it. And Mrs. Merkel, as a responsible statesman in Europe, she basically had then to find a settlement with Lukashenko, which is very unfortunate. And certainly there will be also ultimately a big financial uh, sum from the European Union paid uh, to Mr. Lukashenko, which is also very unfortunate. But given the complexity and the high stakes, I don't see a big uh, different, uh, any alter alternative to finding a settlement now in the name of our values, in peace in Europe, and also for the people in the forests of Belarus. Uh, Mr. Pickler, uh, you see from uh, one point of view, Merkel is trying to, uh, you know, act uh, in diplomatic way. Uh, Polish authorities try to actually behave in tough way. Yeah, so we see the difference. And uh, according to the Treaty on European Union, actually all member states of European Union, they're equal. Yes, obviously Germany is more powerful, more economically powerful than other member states. But according to European Union law, all states are equal. So um, do you see here uh, actually um, uh, another type of manipulation by Lukashenko, when Lukashenko actually got what he wanted, he got uh, Merkel's call, and now uh, Belarus media and other outlets will manipulate the reaction which, which uh, other member states expressed after Merkel called Lukashenko. So basically, uh, Putin and Lukashenko uh, actually can feel very happy because they received an update what they wanted at the beginning. Yeah, well, when I was um, uh, listening to, to the analysis of, of, of Günther, I thought um, that maybe um, it could create a situation where, I mean, uh, obviously Lukashenko is blackmailing the EU. Yeah? So he's blackmailing, he's creating a terrible situation and people's lives are on stake and also the relationship between member states are on stake. Uh, you already mentioned the situation, Poland, Germany, it's always complicated. And um, Lukashenko enjoys that situation. But if he's blackmailing and if he gets what he wants, um, I think it's, a, it's going to be a, a Pyrrhus win. It's, going, it's not going to, to, to help him for a long time because the European Union will, um, after that, and also after what happened to the plane and protesty, which if you remember, so after all that um, incidents, the European Union will, and we know how slow it works, but it will find a long-term strategy, and then um, it will really consider Belarus the enemy that it is. <clears throat> and I want to talk about <clears throat> Austrian politics. So for Austria, um, Lukashenko was a quite normal president. We had <clears throat> normal relations. It was quite, I mean, um, I was a little bit ashamed there, yeah, like very often because of, uh, but after the um, escalation last year, when Lukashenko really turned this comic book dictator style, there was a lot of changing. Yeah? And now um, with this crisis in Poland, um, the change will um, be even tougher yeah? because um, if there is, if the European Union is directly involved um, and affected, then we know that we have to react and on the long Long term we will so if he is successful with this blackmailing it will not be uh, for good uh, thank you very much uh, mr kulchik mm -hmm. you see now that uh, actually belarus uh, is uh, uh, you know uh, belarus has fallen to the knees of russia yeah and basically now uh, putin controls lukashenko and controls uh, belarus 
Um, uh, do you actually think that it was wise policy from the point of European Union to, uh, or to allow Lukashenko to become closer to Putin? Because actually what Lukashenko wanted in the beginning, he wanted to preserve its power in Belarus from one point, and from another point, he wanted money, 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 money. So European Union has more money than actually Russia, much more money. European Union is a, uh, is a much prosperous uh, in, in, uh, than, than Russian Federation. Maybe it was actually wiser from a point of European Union to uh, buy Lukashenko, to buy all his bureaucrats and to have uh, you know, uh, such ally as Lukashenko than to have such foil as Lukashenko. Well, uh, Dietmar Pichy had just mentioned that for a long time, Lukashenko was a normal president for the most European Union countries. Um, because Lukashenko played a game between the European Union and, 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 and Russia, I mean, he, he wanted a reunification with Russia, but believing that he would then be the president of a United Belarus and, and, and Russia. Uh, and the European Union also played this game with Lukashenko trying to get him out of the influence uh, from, uh, from uh, Putin. But yeah, we know what happened last year. And if the European Union, and it is based on human rights, it is based on human rights, so it cannot accept any game to, as you mentioned it or said it, by Lukashenko. That, that's impossible. If you do that, you lose your credibility. Uh, and that's uh, now a tricky situation for the European Union, because we know, but this was clear for everybody who knows about geopolitics, Russia would do whatever they can do to get it under control, I mean, Belarus, and split up the European Union. On the other side, it was also clear that uh, a guy like Lukashenko is not acceptable on the, long, on the long run for a European Union, which is based on values. By the way, he's not a dictator, he's a tyrant. I think we have to mention that in, in clear words. Thank you, Mr. Fechlinger. Uh, you are promoting uh, European uh, Union enlargement, stating that the European Union uh, has to elaborate a new policy towards Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, uh, and to foster the, the enlargement. Uh, also, this enlargement process has to encompass the Balkan countries. Um, do you actually really think that now European Union uh, is ready uh, for the great enlargement and to allow Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova to enter um, uh, to enter European Union. From my point of view, unfortunately, European Union uh, still uh, uh, considers, uh, even despite the occupation and annexation of Crimea, despite the situation with the war between Russia and Georgia, European Union still considers our three countries as a part of Russian sphere of influence. Uh, and this is a great problem. And actually these uh, arguments, they, uh, you know, they are lying under the table. What do you think about this? Look, first of all, to Belarus, we have to see that it's lost for us. So we can really not influence the decisions and the life of the Belarusian people, unfortunately. But we can do very much uh, many things for the Ukrainians, for the Moldovans, for the Georgians. We can do all the difference. We can make all the difference for them. And I think it is absolutely possible to start now with the same status, which is the EU potential candidate status for these three countries. Normally, uh, the transition the membership takes about 15 years to join fully as a full member, like Poland from 89 to 2004. It's 15 years. So when you see 2014 was the year of Euromaidan, the revolution of dignity, 15 years plus, so 2029, that's absolutely possible. We just have to want it together and Ukraine to the reforms and the EU to be open. And it's absolutely possible the same also for Georgia and for Moldova, because they have decided for the European way with the DCFDA, they have done the regulatory preparations already very much. And so now, I really call on all European authorities, let's do more for our friends. Let's not be paralyzed by our enemies yeah? because we have no influence on the Russian situation, on the Belarusians. But we can make all the difference for our friends in Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia who want to join the European Union and welcome. It's amazing. Let's come, let's join, let's make the process 
and let's join the European Union in the next 10, 15 years. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pichler. Uh, you obviously follow the situation from the point of uh, media literacy. Um, do you think that uh, uh, actually uh, now there is any type of collaboration uh, uh, on the point of media literacy between uh, Ukrainian media outlets and European uh, media, outlets, uh, media outlets and even uh, within the European Union? Is there any collaboration uh, between media outlets uh, in order to prevent uh, different types of uh, different types of fakes and manipulation in regarding the uh, the crisis with these migrants or refugees um i would like to answer the question in a general way because of about the current crisis i know that um eu versus disinformation so this european fact checking sites they are publishing something but um as i mentioned before lukashenko's um propaganda or cyber propaganda it's so bad i mean there is nothing to uh, there is no spin and there is no storyline you can make this look any better yeah so i think it's not an issue if we compare it to 2014 to the revolution of dignity what what happened there or to to many other events we had a lot of more narratives and and or if, if we compare to mh17 we had 10 20 50 different um stories and some of them were even funny but it, it's not funny if we're talking about so many people died and nobody is responsible and but here we don't have it almost not at all so i would like to answer it in general i would say there is not enough cooperation um, between uh, western european or central european countries and for instance ukraine um, i think there's a lot of expertise we could um, use um, the founder of stop fake um, is going to come to vienna and in, in um, i think on the 3rd of December or 2nd of December, and I will have maybe a discussion with him. I heard about it today, it's not 100% sure, but uh, we will um, try to, to have a lot of talks. I remember that um, the Pan-European Union and Reinhardt, um, they are doing a lot of events and um, also with, with experts from, from Ukraine, with their expertise, with their, um, special experience because um our journalists they could need it because they don't have the um i mean it's for so many years if if something happens in ukraine whom you gonna ask um, the journalist who is usually responsible for russia yeah if something happens in moldova maybe the same if something happens in belarus of course if we talk about minsk you call the correspondent in in moscow yeah this is what we should not have so it's not only about media literacy basically media literacy is that you did you know where you're going to dig to get the information yeah also as a journalist yeah and this is what we don't have so we, we should have educated journalists we should have experts on on countries not on regions not with this influence thing uh, this cold war thinking yeah, because this is a real problem we have independent countries now and it's an education thing and it's not only about a media literacy course uh, but um to finish my answer um, sometimes it's even that we have journalists in Vienna who, who use um, sources that are completely not reliable and completely filled with fake news and also with Russian fakes. Thank you very much, dear gentlemen, for joining this discussion. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fecklinger. I would like to remind that Mr. Fecklinger is the chairman of the organization the European for Tax Reforms. Uh, Mr. Reinhard Klochik, uh, who is the chairman of uh, the Austrian Division of One European Union, and Mr. Dietmar Fickler, who is the programmatic director of the Center of Media Literacy in Vienna. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, dear audience uh, for following this discussion. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Bye.